each of you to our services here today at First Baptist Church. And uh, I want to welcome those who will be joining us by television as well today. Uh, looks like between sickness and the long weekend, we've got several folks who are out today. But I'm very, very grateful that you've made the effort to be here. And we, we want to welcome you here at First Baptist today. Uh, we do have some guests with us, and we're glad to have guests. Um, Mary and Will are with us, and I'm uh, very thankful to have them moved in. Um, I think they're going to be having open house later this afternoon. They want you all to stop by and see their, see their home. Actually, no, that's not true. <laughs> they've, <laughs> they've just literally got moved in, all this stuff. But uh, um, Will's parents are here with us this morning, and Mary's mother is with us as well. And they've got a friend, AJ, who's come over to help, and we're very thankful to have them sitting over here. And I'm sure Will and Mary will both be in on their best behavior today having their in-laws both sitting next to them and uh, speaking of in-laws Benita sent me a wonderful joke this week on the internet I have to share it with you before we get too serious this morning it's about a man and who took his wife and his mother-in-law to the Holy Land to visit and they had a great time but towards the end of it his mother-in-law died and he was confronted with what to do. And they said, you can send her back to America for $5,000 or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. And the man thought about two seconds and said, I'll take her back to America with me. And he said, well, that'll cost you $5,000. It's just $150 to, to keep her here in the Holy Land. He said, listen, 2,000 years ago, there's this man who died and they buried here and he rose again and I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> so... That may not relate to anybody here, but um, Benita knew to send it to me, and I um, appreciate it. But anyway, glad you're here. Uh, as you came in this morning, you should have received a bulletin. Uh, has our order of worship. Uh, also has a lot of announcements, uh, some that didn't get included. Um, one being that tonight we will be having our, our evening sessions, our discipleship training. Uh, we have three groups that are meeting for the adults. There's a women's study that's being taught by Gloria Jones. Uh, we've got an Andy Griffith Bible study series uh, based on some videos that Bill Birchfield is teaching, and I'm leading a study on the book of Exodus. Uh, the youth and children are meeting, and uh, just everything's going on, so please come tonight if you can. The deacons will also meet tonight uh, at 7 o'clock. Tomorrow night, the service ministry committee, very important meeting. Please plan to be there. Senior adults, listen carefully. Uh, we've got a trip planned for this Tuesday to go to Knoxville to see the Ink and Blood History of the Bible exhibit. I've heard some wonderful things about this exhibit. Looking forward to going. We originally said you needed to sign up by, one, I think, noon tomorrow. We need for you to sign up by 1 o'clock today. Uh, we've got to call them this afternoon and tell them exactly how many is coming. So if you plan to go with us on Tuesday, please tell me before you leave today or, or call or somehow. But let me know uh, just as soon as possible that you plan to go because I've got a call and uh, it's going to be $10 per person. I've got to go ahead and charge uh, our tickets. So if you're planning to go with us, and we still have room for, for a number of people to go on the bus, but uh, let me know today if you plan to go on that trip. Uh, this weekend, we have our winter Bible study, and I want to emphasize that to you and those who are watching at TV as well. Friday night and Saturday night and the next Sunday, both services will be focusing on the book of Jeremiah. Dr. Don Garner, who is chairman of the Department of Religion at Carson Newman College, will be coming and, and leading that study. And I just encourage you very, very much uh, to be here. This is a unique opportunity for us each year to, to have this focused time studying a book of the Bible, having a great teacher come in and lead us. And I just hope you won't miss the opportunity. Please come Friday night and Saturday night, Sunday uh, as well. Next Sunday is also a special day for another reason. And Dewey, you're going to tell us about that? And ladies, you don't have to listen to this now. Yeah, they do. Well, they don't either. They don't <laughs> uh, we Anyhow, to... next Sunday is Baptist Men's Day, and breakfast will be at 8 o'clock. All you men and boys, come and bring your friends. We're going to have scrambled eggs, sausage, gravy, biscuits, and perhaps apples. So come and enjoy it with us. The men will be leading the service next week and uh, also going to be filling the choir. And I think the plan is for all the men to go to the choir at 10.30, Beth. Is that what I've heard? So men, if you're going to sing in the choir next week, just need to leave Sunday school a little bit early and go to the choir room. And, uh, and you'll be able to learn a number of special anthems in 15 minutes before you come down here. So, <laughs> so uh, I don't know what you're singing, but you're going to do good, and I have no doubt about that. There, there's a message here about a couple of other trips coming up, uh, an announcement about the youth going to concert in April, and we need to start taking reservations for that. 
since we have a limited number of tickets. And we've been signing up for a group to go see Big River at Cumberland County Playhouse. We only have two tickets left. So if you thought about going, now's your time uh, to sign up because they're going to be gone probably this week. If we do have enough people who still want to go, we probably can still get some more tickets, but we need to know that as soon as possible. Uh, you'll see that we still need just a few more homes for the Carson Newman Acapella Choir that's going to be coming to do a concert on March 3rd. I think we're down to just needing rooms for four boys and two girls. If you've not uh, uh, signed up and let Beth know that you can house a couple of folks, uh, please do that today before you leave. That would be a big help as well. Well, that's plenty of announcements. Again, thank you for being here today. Uh, I pray that God will, will bless you uh, for coming. But I pray that you'll be a blessing to God in return for all that he's done for you. I mean, that's what worship is all about, giving God the praise, the glory for who he is and for what he's done. And, and if you'll stop and think, if you'll count your blessings, you'll realize that we've got a lot to be thankful for. We've got a lot to praise the Lord for this morning. Let's prepare to do that. Psalm 145 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Let's give him that praise this morning in singing, Great is the Lord, hymn number 12 in your hymnal as we stand and sing. tend to forget how great you are. You know how we are, Lord. We're self-centered people that think of ourselves and our needs. And today we come before you with many thoughts on our minds and many things in our hearts. We tend to be so self-centered that many times we can't even give you one hour a week. Please help us this morning, Lord, to focus with our whole being on you and the reason that we're here, Lord, and that's to worship you. May we do our part to worship you today in this service. 
May we praise you with song. May we hear your word with our hearts as well as our ears and our minds. And may we feel your presence today, Lord, and help us to remember that we need to feel your presence every day, each and every hour of our lives. And we also pray, Lord, that you will help us to focus on you during the week and not just in this service today. Hear us now as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'll ask the children to come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning, guys. It's good to have you here today. How many of you know what a shepherd is? What's a shepherd? What is it, Emily? Somebody who has sheep, okay? Well, in the extended session today, you're going to be reading a story about uh, a story that Jesus told. It was a parable about a man who had 100 sheep. And I don't know that story. you know that story? I heard it in a movie before. You heard it in a movie? Well, I haven't seen that movie. I've read it in the book, though. And in the Bible, it says this man had 100 sheep, and one of them was missing. He, got, he was, you know, bringing them in at night, and he started counting 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. 99. Whoop, one of them's missing. And so he, he said, you know, I can't take this. I've got to go find the one that's missing. So he made sure the others were safe, and he went out looking for the one who was missing. And we're told that eventually he found him, and he picked him up, and he brought him back, and everybody had a big party because he had found the one lost sheep <laughs> that had been missing. <laughs> good, good job. You're right on cue. Right on cue. Why do you think Jesus told us that story? Just because he wanted us to know about sheep and shepherds? I don't think so. I think he told us that story because he wants us to know how much he loves us. I mean, God loves everybody, and, and, but he loves us so much that if we go astray, he's going to come looking for us. He's not going to be content to say, well, everybody else is at church. I'm not going to worry about Will. No, he'll go looking for Will. He'll go looking for you. He'll go looking for me because every one of us is special to God. Did you know that? Did you know you're special to God? Did you know that you're special to God? Did you know that you're special to God? Did you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? Do the rest of you know that? You are. And let's thank him for that. Father, thank you for being our God, for being the good shepherd who watches over us and who loves us like nobody else. Thank you for your patience and care and for the fact that when we stray, you come looking. Not to judge us, not to beat up on us, but to bring us back to the fold. Lord, you truly are great. You're awesome. And we love you. Help us to love you more. Help us to be faithful. Bless these children. Bless all of us as we seek to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We will sing as our fellowship hymn this morning, Oh, How I Love Jesus. I like this song, and I hope it will be your testimony even as you sing. What we do here at First Baptist is ask our members and regular attenders to stand, and we greet one another as our companies play. And if you're our guest for the first time, please remain seated just a moment. Our ushers will find you and give you a visitor's card, and we'd appreciate it if you fill that card out and return it later in the offering plate. But it's good to have each of you here. Let's stand, let's fellowship, and in just a moment we'll sing together, Oh, How I Love Jesus. <laughs>
Beth, we stayed up and watched the ball game last night. We're just not with it today. I'm sorry. Uh, let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 24. Each week, as you know, we read from the Psalms, and this is a part of our prayer time. And so we read together, we pray together, Psalm 24. So I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to read out loud with me. Let's read. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. This morning it is your privilege and mine to go to this King and to take our petitions to him, to offer to him our thanksgiving and our praise, our hearts and our love. Let's take advantage of this moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment where we can pause and be still and bring to you the things that are on our hearts and our minds. Before we ask for anything else, we want to praise you. We want to thank you for being who you are. Your word teaches us this morning that this earth is yours and everything in it, all who live in it are yours. And that includes us. And you have this right to ownership because you are the creator. And this morning we want to affirm that. We praise you. We acknowledge that you are indeed the maker of heaven and earth. And we thank you for your work. We thank you that we're part of that work. We're thankful that you claim us as your own. We are your children. We are your sheep. But Lord, help us to remember that we're yours. We're not ours. We're yours, and that you deserve all the love we can give you. You certainly deserve all the faithfulness, all the obedience we can give you. And I pray that you would help us to do better. We recognize as we read this word that we're so unworthy. When the psalmist asks, who can ascend in the hill of the Lord, who can stand in his holy place, and he answers the question by saying, who has clean hands and a pure heart, we, we almost want to shrink, Lord, because we realize our hands are not always clean, nor are our hearts always pure. We are unworthy, and we acknowledge that. At the same time, we, we know that your word says when we do humble ourselves before you, that you welcome us into your presence. And we thank you for that welcome, for that warm embrace. We thank you for the second chances you give us, for forgiveness, for the hope of better days to come, of the hope of, of doing better. We thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. We thank you for your word that gives us guidance. We thank you for your spirit who, who helps us day by day, who, who shows us the way and who empowers us to do your will. And I pray that your spirit will help us day by day. And as Bonnie prayed earlier this morning, to, to seek your presence, to seek your face. Lord, thank you for being a part of our life, not just here on Sunday mornings, but every day when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're at home, when we're at play, you're there too. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presence. And I thank you for what your presence does for us, for the hope it brings, the comfort it brings, the joy it brings. Thank you, Lord for your presence. Lord, today we would pray for those who are sick, and there are many, so many. We would pray for those who grieve, and again, there are many. We pray for those who are traveling this weekend, that you would bless them with traveling mercies. We pray for those who are struggling, for those who are alone. 
We pray for those who are away from home, who are in foreign lands, who, who are, are fighting for our country. We pray for those, Lord, who are serving as missionaries. We pray for those who are trying to meet needs. Lord, we pray for ourselves, that we might be your people, that we might be faithful in all we do, in all we think, and all we say. And may that happen even here in this hour. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. At our time of offertory, we sing of the Good Shepherd. Our hymn is number 61, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Will you join us in standing and singing? we pray. Father, we know you have loved us and blessed us with so many things. We thank you for your goodness and all the many blessings that you've given to us. Most of all, Lord, you have blessed us with the assurance of our salvation. We ask today, Lord, at this time that you will open our eyes to all the things you've given us and what you've done for us. Allow us to feel so much gratitude that we give to you, not just with our hands, but with our whole hearts. Help us, Lord, to give generously to you because we want to, not because we have to. And today, as we give our gifts to you, remind us that you taught us to give our very best. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
rendition of a beautiful song. I want to ask all of you to turn in your Bibles again uh, to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. We return today to this passage we've been looking at. We read together again verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12. Would you read with me please God's word and as we read also listen carefully to what the Spirit might have to say to you. Now when he saw the crowds he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the proclamation of his word today. This morning we return to our look at the keys to the blessed life. In the Beatitudes, Jesus lists for us those characteristics and traits that will allow those who are his followers to experience life on a level that is available to no one else. In this important passage of scriptures, he shows us the way to a joyful and a meaningful life. We're going to look at two more keys this morning. In verse 7, we read the first of these where Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, it's been noted before that, that all of the traits listed in the Beatitudes are meant to be found in each and every one of our lives. We've also noted that, that each of the Beatitudes are, are, are related, are interconnected. They, they each call for and demand the other. Some have suggested, however, that when you come to the fifth beatitude, that Jesus shifts gears a little bit on us here. In the first three beatitudes, Jesus speaks of our need, our, our, our need to be poor in spirit, recognizing that, that we have nothing, that we are nothing apart from God. Recognizing our need to mourn, to, to grieve over our own sinfulness as well as the sin in the world. Recognizing our need to be meek in light of this, letting God control our lives. In the fourth beatitude, we see that we are to respond to these needs by hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And Jesus promises that when we do this, we shall be filled. In the Beatitudes that follow, Jesus goes on to reveal what it means 
to be filled, to, to reveal what the results of this feeling is. To begin with, we practice mercy. Now, if you've grown up in church or are even vaguely familiar with the scriptures, you know that, that mercy is one of the, the key themes or concepts of the Bible. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, we see the mercy of God. One of the truly outstanding attributes of God is that God is merciful. In the Beatitudes, we're reminded that God's children must take on the same attribute. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. And he'll state it even clearer later in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, when he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Our God, who is full of mercy, clearly expects those who are his to practice mercy. That's clear enough. But do we really know what mercy is? Have you got a good handle on it? I mean, we certainly continue to, to use the word mercy today, but what's the biblical background? What did Jesus mean when he used the word? Well, as Jesus uses the word mercy, is always active. It is, it is kindness in action. It is pity that is clothed in, in acts of gracious deeds. In, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gives us a good picture of what mercy looks like. If you think about that story and, and think about the role played by the Samaritan, you'll get a pretty good idea of what mercy looks like. But behind the word that Jesus used is a Hebrew word, and that word is chesed. And chesed means the ability to get right inside other people's skin until we are able to see with their eyes, feel with their feelings, and think with their mind. And clearly, this is much more than, than an emotional wave of pity. Mercy understood this way demands a, a deliberate effort of the mind and of the will. When we are merciful, we go out of our way to, to feel what others are feeling so that we might respond to them in a Christ-like manner. Unfortunately, this is something that most people do not even try to do. We tend to be much more concerned about our own feelings than we are for others. We, we typically judge other people strictly from, from our own point of reference. Well, what a difference it would make if we actually made an effort to understand where other people are coming from, the reason why they, they say what and act like they do. I mean, every one of us have had people who either said or did things that hurt us. And when this happens, we, we usually get defensive right away and, and we want to retaliate. And at a minimum, we think ill of the one who has hurt us and we may even choose that we're not going to have anything else to do with them. What Jesus is proposing we do here is not be so quick to judge. Instead, we should remember that there's always a reason why people think and act like they do. And if we knew that reason, it, it would surely make it easier for us to tolerate some of their unkind behavior. It would, would make it easier for us to forgive them. But again, unfortunately, many don't take the time or make the effort to do this. I read recently about a certain preacher who was one day having his shoes shine. He was in a bit of a hurry. And when he thought that the job should have been finished and, and looked down, he noticed that his shoes were in worse condition than they had been at the beginning. And he spoke rather sharply to the young boy who was polishing his shoes. And it was then the little fellow looked up at him and showed a face that, that was wet with tears. I'm sorry, sir, he said, but my mother died this morning and I'm trying to make a little money to buy some flowers to put on her coffin. It was then the preacher saw that it was the boy's tears falling on his shoes that were making a mess and making his shoes worse. And as you might imagine, this, this immediately changed this preacher's perspective. And my guess is if, if we really knew what was behind a lot of the unkind words and acts that come our way, our perspective would change too. We would see that, that the person who has hurt us is also hurting he or she may be lonely, may be afraid, or may just be plain miserable inside. Something may have recently happened to them, or they may still be dealing with, with issues of insecurity going all the way back to childhood. Often we just 
don't know. But as Christians, God expects us to make the effort to try and see things from the other person's side. That's what mercy is all about. And doing so will lead us in most situations to be less critical of others. It, it will cause us to be far more forgiving. Now, by all means, the, the supreme example we have of mercy is God sending his son, Jesus Christ, to earth. In doing so, he became one of us so that he may see things from the other side. You know, we can't say to God, God, you don't know what it's like here on earth because he's been here. He's done that. And this truly is to our benefit. Listen to how the author of the book of Hebrews explains this benefit. He says, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Did you catch that? Because God has been here as one of us. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. Because God has been here as one of us, we may now receive mercy and find grace. Having received that mercy, having found that grace, Christ calls us also to sympathize with others, which in turn will, will allow us to show mercy to those we might not otherwise have given a second chance. When we are merciful to other people, we treat them differently than we would have otherwise. Without mercy, we would not forgive those who have hurt us. Without mercy, we, we would not attempt to do good to those who have betrayed us. Without mercy, we would not work to, to tear down the walls that all too often separate us from others. There can be no denying that Christ expects a lot of us when he calls us to be merciful. There can be no denying that, that this is a very difficult task but when he goes on to say blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy or be shown mercy we cannot help but be reminded that we can't complain about this to man not at all for we have been recipients of mercy ourselves I mean let's face it without God's mercy we would all be lost as Christians, each and every one of us have experienced God's mercy and God's grace in abundance. Having received, we are now expected to give. Now please understand that Jesus is not saying in this beatitude that if you practice mercy, you will receive mercy as though your salvation is dependent on how much mercy you show. Now I realize it may on the surface sound that way. But as Clovis Chapel once noted, Christ is not a merchant who sells. He is a savior who gives. The bottom line is the merciful receive mercy because they are capable of receiving it. And here's how it works. As Christians, we have received God's mercy. Because we have been beneficiaries of this mercy, we quite naturally turn around and extend that mercy to others. In other words, God is merciful to us and that enables us to be merciful to others as well. And if we are not merciful persons, it raises the question of whether we have been saved at all. I mean, let's face it, whether or not to be merciful is not an option for us. It's not a choice. If we have received mercy, we will give mercy. And it is in giving mercy that the gates are left wide open for us to receive even more mercy ourselves. And, and this endless cycle provides for us a joyful and rich life, a life so much better than one where we judge others and withhold mercy. Wouldn't you agree? If we are able to be poor in spirit, if we're able to mourn over the sin in our life, if, if we are, are, are meek and allow God to control our lives, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, not only will we be more merciful, we will be pure in heart. That's where Jesus takes us in verse 8. What does he say? He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
Now this particular beatitude has received a considerable amount of attention over the centuries and primarily because of the promise that is attached to it. The pure in heart, Jesus says, will see God. Well, the desire to see God is as old as mankind itself. Thus, this beatitude speaks to us of both our, our deepest longing as well as our greatest need. And I certainly do want to give attention to, to what it means to, to see God, but we must not put the cart before the horse. Who is it that will see God? It's the pure in heart. Well, who are the pure in heart? That's a good question. One thing we know for sure is that they are not those who have achieved perfection. This is in no way an allusion to sinlessness. If that were the case, we would have to admit that no one will ever see God. So no, purity of heart must mean something else. The word pure here originally meant simply clean. It, it's used in the Bible to, to refer to, to grain that, that has been sifted and cleansed of all chaff. It's a word that's used to describe wine that's not been mixed with water, to describe metals that are free of alloy. The heart Jesus refers to is obviously not that organ of our body that, that pumps blood. Rather, in biblical thought, the heart is the center of the personality. Now, we sometimes use the word heart today to refer to the center of emotion. We just had Valentine's this past week, and, you know, everywhere we looked, there were these bright red hearts. But in Bible days, they understood the heart much more comprehensively. The heart took in the mind or intellect. It took in the will as well as the emotions. Therefore, when Jesus referred to purity of heart, what he was doing was calling for a single-mindedness or a sincerity in approach to God. To be pure in heart means that we will fulfill the great commandment, that we will love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. It means that we will desire God above everything else, desire to know him, desire to, to love him, desire to serve him. This beatitude therefore calls us to examine our love for and our commitment to Jesus Christ. It demands that, that we examine our motives for everything we do. For example, is our service to the Lord done from selfless motives or from motives of self-display? Is the work we do for the church done for Christ or for our own prestige? Is our attendance at church an attempt to truly worship and honor God or, or is it merely done out of habit or, or, or perhaps out of a sense of obligation or even some lesser reason? These are the kind of questions we must ask ourselves. The blessed life lies in keeping Jesus Christ in the forefront. The joyful life is obtained by those who live their lives for the glory of God. Now obviously not all do this like the Pharisees that Jesus had so much trouble with, a lot of us look clean and white on the outside. But in reality, there's a pile of junk, a bunch of dead bones hidden on the inside. Now, we want people to think that our hearts are pure, but they are anything but. Clarence Jordan once said, when men attempt to live a double life spiritually, that is, to appear pure on the outside but are not pure in the heart, they are anything but blessed. Their conflicting loyalties make them wretched, confused, tense, and having to keep their eyes on two masters at once makes them cross-eyed and their vision is so blurred that neither image is clear. I'm afraid that that has been my personal experience more times than I care to admit. And it explains why there, there are many times we do not see God. Jesus said it is the pure in heart who will see God. Well, what does it mean to see God? Was Jesus referring to physical sight or, or was he referring to spiritual vision? And is this promise for, for the, the afterlife, the world to come, or is it for now? And these are important questions. If Jesus has in mind physical sight, and we have to assume that this promise is for the afterlife because the Bible says no one can see God and live. But I'm convinced that Jesus primarily has spiritual vision in mind here. When a person's heart is pure, he or she is able to see or discern God's presence, not in the sweet by and by, but in the blessed here and now. To quote Clovis Chapel again, 
The truth is that if we do not see him in the here and now, we have no promise of seeing him at all. If we do not get acquainted with him in the present today, we, we have no slightest guarantee of enjoying his fellowship in the distant tomorrow. To see God, therefore, is to be sure of him, to realize him amidst all the laughter and tears of life that now is. If we allow God to cleanse and purify our hearts, we too will see God. We will see him clearly in his word. We will see him in nature and in our day-to-day -day circumstances. We will see God in, in the fellowship of believers and in countless other places to boot. For this is his promise. The pure in heart will see God. And what an incredible blessing that is. So let me ask you this morning, how well are you able to see God right now at this moment in your life? We all need to understand that, that how we see God depends on the condition of our hearts. If we're not seeing him, if we're not discerning his presence day by day, it might well mean that there's something wrong with our heart. And I realize that sounds serious, and it is, but I have good news for you. Changing hearts is God's specialty. If your heart's not pure and you would like for it to be, if you would like to be able to see God, I encourage you to join King David in praying. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Would you join me in offering that prayer right now? Lord, as we come into your presence this morning, we would acknowledge that our hearts are not so pure. They need cleansing. They truly do. Our hearts are so divided our lives are so fragmented. There seems to be so little singleness of mind. We just, we just don't get it. And Lord, we would pray today with King David that you would create in each and every one of us a pure heart. That you would renew a steadfast spirit within us. And I thank you that you make that possible. And I thank you for the promise that is attached. That when our hearts are pure, we get to see you. Lord, we get glimpses along the way, but so often we don't see you. And we've been reminded this morning of, of the reason for that. So I pray that you'll work on our hearts today. And that you work on them tomorrow. And the day that will follow. And the day that will follow. And all the days that will follow. I pray also that you would help us to be merciful. Lord, you have been so merciful to us. Every one of us here would be lost. We're not for your grace. We're not for your mercy. We have benefited so much, so much from your mercy. Help us now to be merciful too. Work in our lives, Lord. We, we want the blessed life. We, we want the, the joyful life that Jesus spoke of. And we know we can't obtain it on our own, but with your help, it's possible. It's within our grasp. Help us to grasp it starting today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as our invitation hymn this morning, Breathe on Me. We're going to be asking the Holy Spirit to breathe on us until our hearts are clean. And I hope that will be your prayer. It will not just be a song you sing, but it will be your prayer. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You need to understand that no one's ever going to see God until they first enter into a relationship with him. And if you're here today and you, you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're never going to see God until you make a commitment of your life to him. And if you've not done that, I want to encourage you to do that here and now. Whether you're, you're here this morning with us in the sanctuary, or whether you're watching at home. Those of us who are Christians, our hearts have been changed, but they may not be pure. They may not be what they're supposed to be. And, and that may mean today some of us need to recommit our lives to Christ and ask him to change our hearts again, to make them new. There's a lot of other ways you can respond to the invitation this morning. You may feel God call on your life for some special service. You may feel God's call to this church. And if God's calling you, we invite you to come. It's his invitation this morning. It's not mine. It's not ours. It's his. How are you going to respond? Let's stand and sing.
can't begin to tell you with how much joy it is I share with you that Mary and Will Runyon come today to unite with our church fellowship. They become members, and obviously Mary becomes a member of our church staff, an answer to many, many prayers over many, many months. And I know you rejoice with me this morning in welcoming Mary and Will to our church family and Mary to our church staff. And if you'll join me in that, would you say a good amen at this time? Amen. I know there's one person here who will not say amen, and that's AJ. <laughs> AJ is one of the youth back in Caroline, and he's losing a youth minister today. And AJ, we appreciate you being here and giving up Mary to, to be with us. For the past three years, Mary's been the youth minister at the Caroline Baptist Church in North Carolina, and we are so thankful to welcome her as our new associate pastor. She and Will are going to be standing here at the conclusion of the service. I want you to come and extend to them a warm welcome. They have moved in. Uh, what's the name of that street? Dorchester, yeah, uh, next door to Hilton and Janet, and uh, they um, are just getting settled. Um, I want to remind you that they're still in school. Um, they'll be gone on Mondays and Tuesdays back at Gardner-Webb, and will be with us Wednesday through the rest of the week, so I uh, wanted to let you know a little bit about what her schedule's going to be, but uh, Wednesday will be her first official day, and we're really excited about that, and I just pray and ask you to join with me in praying that God will well, bless Mary with a wonderful ministry, with our children, with our youth, and, and with the rest of us as well. Don't forget, we will be having church tonight at 6. And don't forget, please, our winter Bible study this weekend. I just encourage you so much to come and learn about Jeremiah, who's not a bullfrog. He's a prophet from the Old Testament and a very important prophet, sometimes known as the weeping prophet. And I think you'll find out why if you, if you come to the study. And I do hope to see you Friday, Saturday, and, of course, next Sunday as well. We're going to have the choir close us, and you'll want to come and welcome Mary and Will to our church family.